ahang bante ti saganena saha pancha silani yachami duttiyampi ahang bante ti saganena saha pancha silani yachami tattiyampi ahang bante ti saganena saha pancha silani yachami namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa 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 namo tassa bhagavato arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Buddhang Saranang Gachami Buddhang Saranang Gachami Dhammang Saranang Gachami Dhammang Saranang Gachami Sanghang Saranang Gachami Sangang Saranang Gachami Dutiyampi Buddhang Saranang Gachami Dutiyampi Buddhang Saranang Gachami Dutiyampi Dhammang Saranang Gachami Dutiyampi Dhammang Saranang Gachami Dutiyampi Sangang Saranang Gachami Dutiyampi Sangang Saranang Gachami Tatiyampi Buddhang Saranang Gachami Tatiyampi Buddhang Saranang Gachami Tatiyampi Dhammang Saranang Gachami Tatiyampi Dhammang Saranang Gachami Tatiyampi Sangang Saranang Gachami Tatiyampi Sanggang Saranang Gachami Ti Saranagamanang Niti Tang Amabante Panati Pata Veramani Sikha Padang Samadhyami Panati Pata Veramani Sikha Padang Samadhyami Adinna dana vira manisika padang samadhiya. Adinna dana vira manisika padang samadhiya. Kami su mitcha chara vira manisika padang samadhiya. Kami su mitcha chara vira manisika padang samadhiya. Mutsavata vira manisikaha padang samadhyami. Mutsavata vira manisikaha padang samadhyami. Suramiraya manja pamada thana vira manisikaha padang samadhyami. Suramiraya maja pamada thana Vairamani Sakaha Padang Samadhyami Imani Pancha Sikha Padani Silena Sukatingyanti Silena Bhoga Sampada Silena Niputingyanti Tasma Siddham Visodhaye Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu Sadhu, Sadhu 118 Anapanasati Sutta Mindfulness of Breathing Introductory Section 1. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in the Eastern Park in the palace of Mikara's mother together with many very well-known elder disciples. Disciples, the Venerable Sariputta, the Venerable Mahamoglana, the Venerable Mahakasapa, the Venerable Mahakachana, the Venerable Mahakutilta, 
the venerable maha apina the venerable maha chunga the venerable uh, aniruddha the venerable revata the venerable ananda and the other very well known elder disciples now on that occasion, our mother is the visakha if you don't remember it's not that she was actually mingara's mother mingara was her father-in-law who was against the buddhist teaching and when she showed him what a miserly and wrong-headed person he was he was very grateful to her so he called visakha his mother that's the palace of visakha it's not a palace either it's a a large building that was built for the monks to live in in pubarama pubarama is the name of the monastery and it was visakha the building that visakha built together with the land that she donated now on that occasion elder bikus had been teaching and instructing new bikus some elder bikus had been teaching and instructing 10 bikus some elder bikus had been teaching and instructing 20 30 40 bikus and the new bikus taught and instructed by the elder bikus had achieved successive stages of high distinction on the okay saturday of the 15 on the full of the baba the blessed in the open the he addressed them that because i am content with this progress content progress so our hearts still move and as it attain the unattained to achieve the unachieved to realize the unrealized i shall wait here at savati for the komudi full moon of the fourth month the bikus of the countryside heard the blessed one we wait there at savatis for the komudi full moon of the fourth month and the bikku of the countryside left in due course for savati to see the blessed one and elder bikkhus still more intensively taught and, and, and instructed new bikkhus some elder bikkhus taught and instructed 10 bikkhus some elder bikkhus taught and instructed 20 30 40 bikkhus and the new bikkhus taught and instructed by the elder bikkhus achieved successive stages of high distinction on that occasion the oposatha day of the 15th the full moon night of the komodi full moon of the fourth month the blessed one was seated in the open surrounded by the sangha of bikkhus then serving the silent sangha of bikkhus he addressed addressed them thus bikkhus this assembly is free from prattle this assembly is free from chatter it consists purely of hard word such is the sangha of bikkhus such is it is this assembly such an assembly as is as is worthy of gifts worthy of hospitality worthy of offerings worthy of reveren- reverential salutation an incomparable field of merit for the world such is the sangha of bikkhus such is, is this assembly such an assembly that a small gift given to it becomes great and the great Sir such this sangha of bikkhus such is the sangha of bikkhus such is this assembly such an assembly is rare for the world to see such is this sangha of bikkhus such is this assembly such an assembly as would be worth journeying journeying many leagues with a travel back to see such is this sangha of bikkhus such is this assembly Nine. In this Sangha of Bhikkhus, there are Bhikkhus who are Arahants, with taints destroyed, who, live, who have lived the holy life, 
done what had what had to be done, laid down the burden, reached their own goal, destroyed the fetters of being, and are completely re- liberated through fi- final knowledge. Such bhikkhus are there in this sangha of bhikkhus. In this sangha of bhikkhus, there are bhikkhus who, with the destruction of the five lower feathers, are due to reappear spontaneously in the pure abode and there attain final nibbana without ever returning from that world. Such bhikkhus are there in this sangha of bhikkhus. 11. In this sangha of bhikkhus, there are bhikkhus who, with the destruction of three fetters and with the attenuation of lust, hate, and delusion are once returners, returning once to this world to make an end of suffering. Such bhikkhus are there in the Sangha of bhikkhus. In the Sangha of bhikkhus, there are bhikkhus who, with the destruction of the three fetters, are stream enters, no longer subject to perdition, bound for deliverance, headed for enlightenment, such bhikkhus are there in the Sangha of bhikkhus. In the Sangha of bhikkhus, there are bhikkhus who abide devoted to the development of the four foundations of mindfulness. Such bhikkhus are there in the Sangha of bhikkhus. In the Sangha of bhikkhus, there are bhikkhus who abide devoted to the development of the four right kinds of striving, of the four bases for spiritual power, of the five faculties, of the five powers, of the seven enlightenment factors, of the Noble Eightfold Path. Such bhikkhus are there in this Sangha of bhikkhus. In this Sangha of bhikkhus, there are bhikkhus who abide devoted to the development of loving kindness of compassion, of altruistic joy, of equanimity, of the meditation on foulness, of the perception of impermanence. Such bhikkhus are there in the Sangha of bhikkhus. In the Sangha of bhikkhus, there are bhikkhus who abide devoted to the development of mindfulness of breathing. I think I have a question here, like um, it um, the sutta enumerates the enlightened ones, and then um, I mean uh, there are because who are just practicing, right? And then uh, all types of practicing uh, because or equally there in that sangha. It's not only enlightened ones. Even yeah, I was Uthushanas, just looking for right? that, actually. I, I, don't, I don't see anywhere in the commentary. I, mean, I can't figure out if it talks about them or not. That's what it appears to be. Yeah, in the beginning, I, I thought the, the whole sangha was uh, enlightened. So I kind of surprised is me this part paragraph 15 mindfulness of breathing because when mindfulness of breathing is developed and cultivated it is of great fruit and great benefit when mindfulness of breathing is developed and cultivated it fulfills the four foundations of mindfulness when the four foundations of mindfulness are developed and cultivated they fulfill the seven enlightenment factors. When the seven enlightenment factors are developed and cultivated, they fulfill true knowledge and deliverance. And how bhikkhus is mindfulness of breathing developed and cultivated so that it is of great fruit and great benefit? Here a bhikkhu gone to the forest or to the root of a tree or to an empty hut sits down having folded his legs crosswise, set his body erect and established mindfulness in front of him. Ever mindful, he breathes in. Mindful, he breathes out. 
breathing in long he understands i breathe in long or breathing out long he understands i breathe out long breathing in short he understands i breathe in short or breathing out short he understands i breathe out short he trains thus i shall breathe in experiencing the whole body of breath he trains thus i shall breathe out experiencing the whole body of breath he trains thus i shall breathe in tranquilizing the bodily formation he trains thus i shall breathe out tranquilizing the bodily formation he trains thus i shall breathe in experiencing rapture he trains thus i shall breathe out experiencing rapture he trains thus i shall breathe in experiencing pleasure he trains thus i shall breathe out experiencing pleasure he trains thus i shall breathe in experiencing the mental formation he trains thus i shall breathe out experiencing the mental formation he trains thus i shall breathe in tranquilizing the mental formation he trains thus i shall breathe out tranquilizing the mental formation he trains thus i shall I breathe in just... experiencing the mind he trains thus i shall breathe out experiencing the mind he trains thus i shall breathe in gladdening the mind he trains thus i shall breathe out gladdening the mind he trains thus i shall breathe in concentrating the mind he trains thus i shall breathe out concentrating the mind he trains thus i shall breathe in liberating the mind he trains thus i shall breathe out liberating the mind he trains thus i shall breathe in contemplating impermanence he trains thus i shall breathe out cont contemplating impermanence he trains thus i shall breathe in contemplating fading away he trains thus i shall breathe out contemplating fading away he trains thus i shall breathe in contemplating cessation he trains thus i shall breathe out contemplating cessation he trains thus i shall breathe in contemplating relinquishment he trains thus i shall breathe out contemplating relinquishment bikus that is how mindfulness of breathing is developed and cultivated so that is of great fruit and great benefit i wanted to ask about um paragraph 19 where it says experiencing the mental formation what does it mean the comment uh, says it refers to perception and feeling uh 190 119 oh. mental formation is perception and feeling which is tranquilized by development of successive higher levels of serenity and insight mm -hmm. yeah it's most likely relating to the vitaka and vichara Yeah, it looks like uh, the jhanas. And But then it, it, it's I interesting think. how the commentary points out that this also, because this is mixed, this isn't samatha practice only, or it isn't vipassana practice only. This is a general talk given to a large audience, and so there's lots of aspects of the practice involved. So even in vipassana, there is what you might call the tranquilizing of the mental formations because of course it includes all of the jatasikas the, the akusala ones as well and so it, through through wisdom through mindfulness there's lots of different ways in which there's the tranquilizing it's uh, also worth noting <clears throat> i don't i don't think i realized this before but uh, this has to be done with effort and um by like determining that i'm going to do this right it's not, it's not like i'm letting it happen well, no, through I effort be careful with 
with the idea of effort trying is problematic, wanting something to happen. I would say it's more of your, as you say, determination, the frame of reference, because you can practice meditation just for the purpose of, of cultivating tranquility. And so there's different ways to practice. For example, anapanasati, you can follow the breath, or you can count the breath, or you can be mindful of the actual point of contact. Now, noting at the point of contact is considered vipassana because it's the, the elements. In the stomach, there's the tension, and the, at the nose, there's the heat and the cold. So that is uh, the practice of vipassana. And if, if that's your frame of reference, then you you are determining to cultivate vipassana, for example. Mm -hmm. But in this sutta, and so far what we read, it's like you you train in everything, like you are not excluding anything. So you train... I I don't think you do these all at once or even in this order necessarily. Mm-hmm. Is uh, the Buddha is giving a general talk about, I would say, the various ways in which you can practice anapanasati, and not everyone has to do every single one of these. It's just a complete framework. Even in our tradition, we still practice uh, metta meditation uh, as a supportive meditation. So. It's included here. The biggest takeaway, or a big takeaway, is how the breath, how useful the breath is in so many different things, and how how good of an object it is. There's, I mean, there's honestly nothing special about it, and and someone could become enlightened, or and many people have become enlightened without practicing mindfulness of breathing. So it would be dogmatic to say this is the only right way to practice. There's nothing special about it. It's it's actually just a really good one because it's always there. That's about it. But it's still just rupa, right? It's still just form like any other form. I was I was just thinking in regards to our practice, the Mahasi technique, like we are not ignoring the form, mental formations or feelings or anything. We, we do uh, note everything besides the rising and falling of the abdomen as well. So I feel like, I feel like it's like more uh, like everything is there. Well, well yeah, in, in one sense, even when you're focusing on the breath, say the stomach rising and falling, all four of the satipatthana are involved in that. And that's kind of what the Buddha is saying here. But of course, it's not ignoring the fact that, well, there is Vedana that has nothing to do with the breath at all. Pain in the back or the head or that kind of thing. That's not anapanasati, and it's still the four satipatthana. So there is practice of all of these things outside of the mindfulness of breathing. Just mindfulness of breathing is very central and it involves all of the four satipatthana. Mm -hmm. Fulfillment of the four foundations of mindfulness. And how, bhikkhus, does mindfulness of breathing, developed and cultivated, fulfill the four foundations of mindfulness? Mm -hmm. Bhikkhus, on whatever occasion a bhikkhu, breathing in long, understands, I breathe in long, or breathing out long, understands, I breathe out long. Breathing in short understands I breathe in short, or breathing out short understands I breathe out short. Drains thus. I shall breathe in, experiencing the whole body of breath. Drains thus. I shall breathe out, experiencing the whole body of breath. Drains thus. I shall breathe in, tranquilizing the bodily formation. Drains thus. I shall breathe out, tranquilizing the bodily formation. On that occasion, a bhikkhu abides, contemplating the body as a body, ardent, fully aware and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. I say that this is a certain body among the bodies, namely, in breathing in, in in-breathing, and out-breathing. 
That is why, on that occasion, a bhikkhu abides contemplating the body as a body, ardent, fully aware, and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. Wow, this is such a weird statement. I say this is a certain body among the bodies. The breadth of the body, Bhante. The first, it says, breathing long, breathing short. This is already the body of the breath, right? Yeah, it's a bit... I think he's confusing it a little bit too much by, again, I think we've talked about this before where this translation is odd, where he translates Kaye, Kaya as uh, sees the body as a body. Is that how he translates it? A certain think, body among the bodies. No, no, before that, where he says, uh, I and be contemplating the body as a body. That's, I mean, it's not quite related, but it kind of sets it up for a bit of a misunderstanding. It's not contemplating the body as a body, contemplating the body as body, or in in regards to the body, one sees body. It's literally what it says, kaye, kaya nupasi. In regards to the body, kaye, kaya nupasi, he sees body. Not sees a body like a, a thing or like a, an entity, but it's seeing it as body. In, in other words, just seeing it for what it is. So it is interesting. It says kaiesu, which is plural, in regards to the bodies. This is a certain body. So that's kind of correct, but. It's because of the word Gaia doesn't mean body exactly. It means uh, like a group or a, a heap collection, like a, a body of water or a body of government or something like that. I see. Thank you. So it's 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 because of the the way the bird word is understood in. I guess kind of in English, because we do use body of water. That's not right, but body of government, I don't know. It's a, a, a whole thing made up of parts. Um, and so it basically is more like saying, in regards to things that are physical, this is a thing that is physical. That's It's quite simple. It's not meant to... I mean, the Buddha is not making some profound doctrinal statement here, except to, to say that the the uh, asas, asasa pasasa, the in breaths and out breaths, are a physical thing, a certain physical thing among physical things. And this is kind of important because of how, it, funnily enough, there are groups that have taken this oh, this sort of thing overly lit literal. And say that kaya kaya nupasi is you have to actually see visually a body inside of your body. There's actually a very very famous group of practitioners in Thailand who got this all wrong and believe that the Buddha is inside of you and a body inside a body inside a body, and you just have to visualize. And they get into these weird visualizations where eventually you see. Arahant, the Arahant body, and that's how you become an Arahant. I think I heard or someone said something similar about Aura. Auras, like she was saying, like, but what about the Aura? I see around the people this faint light or something. Yeah, I don't know about that. I know some people can have what's called synesthesia, I think it's called. Or I, I don't even know if that's what they would have, but there's people who see see such things uh, based on uh, things that aren't light. So they'll see colors based on... Some people hear, when they hear sounds, there's a color associated with it. Mm -hmm. And some people, I, I talked to a monk who said he, when when people spoke, 
he saw colors based on their defilements. He was able to determine their defilements. Now, I think he's probably wrong about that uh, technically because it's still his own interpretation of what he sees and hears. And uh, probably most of the time he was right because you can perceive people's defilements based on what they say and how they say it and what they do and how they do it. Even when people walked, he could tell, he said, their defilements. But again, I think it's not technically true. It's just his interpretation that was pretty astute. So I don't know if auras, this phenomenon of just seeing colors around people that have nothing to do with what they're doing or saying. I'm not sure about that. It seems like it's probably another similar thing. It's just uh, so to me, that sounds like more like body among the bodies <laughs> type of thing or belief system or I mean if you believe in that like you can you can imagine or see uh, stuff around the body can't you yeah I don't I don't know how that relates it it's just people sometimes just see colors people see mm -hmm. colors around people's bodies I'm not sure where it comes from well, the Buddha himself had uh, an aura, the colors That's of the right. Buddhist flag. So it may be that yeah. we all do have auras that people can see. But yeah. he, he, he exhibited uh, it only specific uh, occasions, like when he was contemplating the Abhidhamma and the, the Bodhi Tree, uh, when he was contemplating the Patana chapter, or Pat the book of Patana, the, the aura came out because uh, his blood was so purified. There, there's an explanation to that. It's good to know that there is a reference to the auras in the in the teachings. Understands, for instance, I breathe long. Is that because I think the way of phrasing is similar within Satipatthana Sutta. Is that a kind of noting? No, oh, it's, it's just a, a clarity of observation that you see it as it is. And when, when it said that planes thus, I shall breathe out, or with, with the a certain instruction, is that the intent was put there? Or? Again, I think it's just the frame of reference and which one's practicing, different ways to practice. What is your intent in regards to practicing? So it's, it's more similar like a determination. You just, uh, the text says that you make like similar with a determination and that, that's it or? Yeah, it's also the this, the way that you're practicing. There are different ways of practicing, and some just lead to samatha jhana, some lead to vipassana. Okay, thank you. Because on whatever occasion a bhikkhu trains thus, I shall breathe in experiencing rapture, trains thus, I shall breathe out experiencing rapture, trains thus, I shall breathe in experiencing pleasure, trains thus, I shall breathe out experiencing pleasure, trains thus, I shall breathe in experiencing the mental formation, trains thus, I shall breathe out experiencing the mental formation, trains thus, I shall breathe in tranquilizing the mental formation, trains thus, I shall breathe out tranquilizing the mental formation. On that occasion, a bhikkhu abides contemplating feelings as feelings, ardent, fully aware and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. I say that this is a certain feeling among the feelings, namely giving close attention to in-breathing and out-breathing. Uh, there's a note which says, M.A. explains that close attention, dukkha, Manasikara is not itself actually feeling, but is spoken of as such only figuratively. 
in the second tetrad the actual feeling is the pleasure mentioned in the second clause and also the feeling comprised by the expression mental formation in the third and fourth clauses that is why on that occasion a bhikkhu abides contemplating feelings as feelings ardent fully aware and mindful having put away covetousness and grief for the world Yeah I don't understand why you said um, I shall breathe in experience pleasure why why is that those are the jhana factors i think preeti sukha oh yes. okay thank you bikus on whatever occasion a bikut trains does i shall breathe in experience in the mind trains does i shall breathe out experience in the mind trains dust i shall breathe in gladden in the mind trains dust i shall breathe out gladden in the mind trains dust i shall breathe in concentrate in the mind trains dust i shall breathe out concentrate in the mind trains dust i shall breathe in liberate in the mind trains dust i shall breathe out liberate in the mind on that occasion A bhikkhu abides contemplating mind as mind, ardent, fully aware and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. I do not say that there is the development of mindfulness of breathing for one who is forgetful, who is not fully aware. That is why on that occasion a bhikkhu abides contemplating mind as mind, ardent, fully aware and mindful. having put away covetousness and grief for the world because on whatever occasion a bhikkhu trains thus i shall breathe in contemplating impermanence trains thus i shall breathe out contemplating impermanence trains thus i shall breathe in contemplating fading away trains thus i shall breathe out contemplating fading away trains thus i shall breathe in contemplating cessation trains thus i shall breathe out contemplating cessation trains thus i shall breathe in contemplating re- re- relinquishment trains thus i shall breathe out contemplating relinquishment on that occasion a bhikkhu abides contemplating mind objects as mind objects ardent fully aware and mindful having put away covet covetness and grief for the world having seen with wisdom the abandoning of covetness and grief he closely looks on with equanimity that is why on that o- occasion a bhikkhu abides contemplating mind objects as mind objects ardent fully aware and mindful having put away covetness and grief for the world because that is how mindfulness of breathing developed and cultivated fulfills the four foundations of mindfulness fulfillment of the seven enlightenment factors and how because with the four foundations of mindfulness developed and cultivated fulfill the seven enlightenment factors because on whatever occasion a bhikkhu abides contemplating the body as a body ardent fully aware and mindful having put away covetousness and grief for the world on that occasion unremitting mindfulness is established in him on whatever occasion unremitting mindfulness is established in a bhikkhu on that occasion the mindfulness enlightenment factor is aroused in him and he develops it and by development it comes to fulfillment fulfillment in him abiding thus mindful he investigates and examines that that state with wisdom and embarks upon a full inquiry into him on whatever occasion abiding thus mindful he bhikkhu investigates and examines that and ex- examines that state with wisdom and embarks upon a full inquiry into it on that occasion the investigation of states enlightenment factor is aroused in him and he develops it 
and by development it comes to fulfillment in him. In one who investigates and examines that state with wisdom and embarks upon a full inquiry into him, tireless energy is aroused. On whatever occasion, tireless energy is aroused in a bhikkhu who investigates and examines that state with wisdom and embarks upon a full inquiry into him. On that occasion, the energy enlightenment factor is aroused in him and he develops it. And by development, it comes to fulfillment in him. 33. In one who has aroused energy, unworldly rapture arises. On whatever occasion, unworldly rapture arises. In a bhikkhu who has aroused energy, on that occasion, the rapture enlightenment factor is aroused in him and he develops it. And by, by development, it comes to fulfillment in him. In one who is rapturous, the body and the mind become tranquil. On whatever occasion the body and the mind become tranquil in a bhikkhu who is rapturous, on that occasion the tranquility enlightenment factor is aroused in him and he develops it. And by development it comes to fulfillment in him. Uh, it's not unworldly rapture, is that how he translates it? It's uh, immaterial, it's just simply a mental thing. It's, the meaning is it's not rapture that has anything to do with um, physical experiences. It's a immaterial thing, spiritual. So I guess, yeah, the idea of being unworldly, unworldly, what his word is that he uses. Nira Misa Iti. 35. In one whose body is tranquil and who feels pleasure, the mind becomes concentrated. On whatever occasion the mind becomes concentrated in a bhikkhu whose body is tranquil and who feels pleasure, on that occasion the concentration enlightenment factor is aroused in him. And he develops it, and by development it comes to fulfillment in him. He closely looks on it. He closely looks on with equanimity at the mind thus concentrated. On whatever occasion a bhikkhu closely looks on with equanimity at the mind thus concentrated. On that occasion, the equanimity enlightenment factor is aroused in him and he develops it. And by development, it comes to fulfillment in him. Bhikkhus, on whatever occasion a bhikkhu abides contemplating feelings as feelings, ardent, fully aware and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. The equanimity enlightenment factor is roused in him, and he develops it, and by development, it comes to fulfillment in him. Because on whatever occasion, a bhikkhu abides contemplating mind as mind, ardent, fully aware, and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world, the equanimity enlightenment factor is aroused in him and he develops it. And by developing, it comes to fulfillment in him. Because on whatever occasion a bhikkhu abides contemplating mind objects as mind objects, ardent, fully aware, and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world, the equanimity enlightenment factor is aroused in him and he develops it. And by development, it comes to fulfillment in him. Because that is how the four foundations of mindfulness developed and cultivated fulfill the seven enlightenment factors. Fulfillment of true knowledge and deliverance. And how because do the seven enlightenment factor developed and cultivated fulfill true knowledge and deliverance? Here, Bhikkhu, a Bhikkhu developed the mindfulness and enlightenment factor, which is supported by seclusion, dispassion, and cessation, a repentance in rel relinquishment. He develops the investigation of state enlightenment factor, the energy enlightenment factor, the rapture enlightenment factor, the tranquility enlightenment factor, 
the concentration and lengthening factor, the equanimity and lengthening factor, which is supported by seclusion, dispersion, and cessation, and ripens in relinquishment. Bhikkhu, this is how the seven enlightenment factor developed and cultivate, fulfilled through knowledge and deliverance. That is what the Blessed One said. The Bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One word. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Bante, sorry, when we um, uh, when we read the word uh, anapana sati, sati have the same meaning of the way we use in uh, vipassana. So to be aware of the breath. Well, sati doesn't mean awareness. Sati means remembrance. So it's it's the ideas of uh, some kind of meditation on it some kind of application of uh, active remembering so usually related to to reciting a word like if you are counting the breath you can say in one out one in two out two uh, if you're watching the stomach, you can say rising, falling. I mean, the different ways of practicing anapanasati, depending on what your goal is, what your focus is. But the sati is the active process of applying the mind to remember the object, to keep the object in mind, basically, or grasp it firmly, grasp it properly, grasp it fully. So anapana is not all re- related with the breath. Well, ana means, ana and pana mean in-breaths and out-breaths. Mm. Thank you, Bhante. There are other meditations also using the term sati, like Buddha anusati, Jaga anusati, Devana, Deva anusati, Marana anusati. So you can't yeah, refer to the, uh, the, the, it's not awareness, which is often a mistake that people make when trying to, translate mindfulness or explain it it's the application it, it's it's indicating an actual meditation practice most of the time where you apply the mind to it or or direct the mind to the object to the subject of the topic like when you say to yourself buddho buddho that's buddha nusati so is mindfulness a better term i mean I know that we talked, for instance, in the mentorship program that maybe we can say that our practice uh, is a kind of mindfulness uh, practice. And from this point of view, I'm I'm asking when we talk with others. So can we say that Uh, better than awareness or? Well, I think the good thing about the word mindfulness is it's not a word that is used very much in the English language. It is used from time to time in other contexts, but quite rarely, to be honest. So because it's used so rarely, what sati means, but because it's become such a Buddhist word, it's not terrible. You just have to explain what exactly you're referring to. Or not. I mean, you, you just name it that, and then you tell people how to practice. Do this. That's that's all. Yeah, I understand the the, the translation of sati, and I agree with it. But um, I was thinking about when approaching others. Um, Again, you just say practice in this way. This is mindfulness practice, and they'll understand it in the way you want them to understand it. Okay, thank you. I mean, it is kind of somewhat problematic when people say, oh, I'm not, I'd rather not use the mantra, I just want to be mindful. Or they don't say it, they usually say it, I, I, I wasn't using the words, but I was just being mindful of the object, because they think of mindfulness as awareness. When you're aware of it, you're mindful, but that's not really what the word sati is being used for. It's pretty clearly referring to something a bit more active. And generally the mantra, I mean, it's just such an ancient, common 
ever you know used in in every context in all sorts of traditions and certainly in the time of the buddha use of a mantra would have been so just commonplace that that's basically what it was referring to the application of the mantra cultivates a specific state of mind clarity and focus precision yeah, if the mantra is used like we use it, yeah, but the word mantra, I think, sometimes comes with a baggage as well because there are those incantations and they are called mantras like Om Mani Padme Hum and others. Yeah, but are they're mantras. used in the same way. They're just used for different purposes. It's still the same idea. So the unique thing about what we do is the mantra is focused on reality, is ultimate reality, but the idea is still the same. Like Buddha Nusati uses a mantra saying Buddha, Om Mani Padmayam is just basically a fancy way of saying Buddha, Buddha, or something similar. It's a spiritual focus on a, an object. Om Mani Padmayam isn't a great one because it's too complex. It's not the kind of thing that would have been recommended in early texts. And do you do you have any idea, I guess, like what the heart means when uh, another tradition, uh, Tarawa, the Buddhist tradition, what talks about like the heart? The heart uh, I is think just another the, word for mind. For Unless mind, you're talking okay. about the physical hadaya. Hadaya no, no, is, is used to refer to the actual physical heart, but in, in most in many contexts, it's just used to refer to the mind. Yeah, the citta, uh, because I heard them um, say citta and and heart the same. Yeah, well, the, there's you'll read you'll read modern commentators explaining that uh, there's a, an issue that in English some. Well, I guess it's fairly common to separate heart and mind. Mind in English in common discourse is by many in many circles thought of as the intellectual side of us, whereas the heart is the emotional side of us. Mm -hmm. So there's heart and mind. And there are there are idioms about it as well, like I don't and I can't think of them, but it's like don't let your mind get in the way of your heart or something like that. Follow your heart, that sort of thing. Of course, it doesn't, it doesn't have any it doesn't have any meaning in Buddhism because they're interchangeable. But you could think that even in the time of the Buddha, there was perhaps that that sort of distinction in common parlance where people would think of one as being the mind and one as being the heart, because we have both words referring to the same okay. thing from a Buddhist context. Yeah, it's just um, because we are living in this society and we understand the, the heart being this emotional part, it's just so confusing when when you hear the heart, you see it with the heart, blah, blah, blah. And I, I immediately, I, I couldn't understand what they are talking about, like, uh, is that uh, anywhere backed up uh, by the um, Dhamma, not by the Buddha? Is the Hadevatu, Hadevatu where the mind is said to be associated with the Vatu Rupa? So there's no, but there's also had, is also used in, the, in Pali mm. to refer directly to the mind itself. Good to know. Thank you. And also when people say, what does your heart say? It means like, how, what do you feel about that topic? Like, well, but we also that. say memorize something by heart, which has nothing to do with emotion. It's not like you memorize it emotionally. So we use them interchangeably. I know that, I know that passage by heart. It doesn't mean anything emotional. It means I know it from memory. And why is the mind and the heart seen as the same from the Buddhist perspective? Because I didn't quite understand. Well, it's not. It's just the words are used colloquially, colloquially in that way. Uh, like just people, as they are in English. 
meaning the people in the time of Buddha when they were talking, they would do that. Yeah, people today as well. We, we use the word heart to mean mind. It's it's just really difficult for us to understand because in our language, it's not, we, we never use the heart like that, hmm. I guess. So, if, like, even the example you said, uh, knowing by heart, it's, it doesn't mean anything to me. It's, yeah, it's a, fr it's a phrase in English. That's it. From the heart. If it's something, if you're sincere about something, it's not even quite emotional. It's just the more, the more emotional side of us. Honest. I'm speaking from the heart. Yeah, um, when, when I yeah, tr translate yeah. that, yeah, when I translate that and say that in my language, then it's it means that I'm most honest about it. Or yeah, it's more sincere. Like yeah, there's a bit of a distinction. It's you can be yeah, I guess I guess honest. But when you really mean something, it's from the heart. When you really mean it. Bante, what I when I am mindful, I. I become more ethical. What I mean is any explanation, more explanation to this. Explanation for why you become more ethical? Yeah, when, when I am mindful. Well, ethics relates to happiness, suffering. And so because you can see what is not just happiness and suffering, but what is uh, based on attachment, based on excess, let's say. It's excessive to cling to something. And so because of being mindful, you just don't bother clinging. It's like, you can think of it like water. Water is this universal solvent that kind of dissolves everything. When you're mindful, it kind of feels like that. You're just dissolving things, and all of the stickiness is just dissolved. It's just washed away. All of the excess. It's just excessive to like or dislike or to even just extrapolate on things, make more of them than they actually are. Because you're not making more of things than they actually are, there's no possibility for liking or disliking, which are the basis of unethical behavior. Thank you, Bhante. Bhante, is passion a bad thing? I thought, I thought we need some passion to finish some work or working with Sangha. Do we need to be in the dispassionate state all the time? We need to see clearly, so maybe you can investigate passion and learn for yourself. Things are not bad things, per se. We can say things like that, like something is bad or something is evil, but it's not technically true. It's useful to say that sometimes, but it's more useful to see it clearly. And as I was saying, the mindful state, sees the excessive nature of such things, that they're just excessive. There's no point to them because things don't have a point. There's experiences don't have a point to them. They just arise and cease. Reality doesn't admit to the possibility of things being worth clinging to. I see. Okay. Thank you. So we make these things up out of delusion or ignorance. We make up this idea in our mind that, oh, this is valuable, this is worthwhile, this is mine, this is something I have to do, this I have to protect or I have to chase away. And we make this all up. And it turns out to be just delusion. It turns out to just be uh, castles in the cloud with no foundation. When you see clearly, you realize how, how mistaken it all is, how unfounded it all is. Chanda and Navirya are the useful qualities. Passion sounds more like uh, containing some kind of liking or uh, attachment. Well, even Chanda can be good or bad. I mean, the best thing is to just 
be mindful of them. You can see for yourself what's valuable. You don't have to hold on to something as valuable or worry about mistakenly letting it go through the practice of mindfulness. Oh no, if I'm mindful, I might let go of something useful. It's not really a possibility. Yeah, I I just wanted to mention that this passion is a result of the practice. It's not like you develop it or something. Right? Like yeah. it's not like yeah, you it's be- quite simple. You you're just looking. And if you look objectively, you'll see the truth. That's all. Mindfulness isn't saying, oh, I must be like this or be like that. Well, you must do. All you must do is is look and look objectively and look in such a way that you're not falling prey to partiality. And uh, what uh, what we need to understand is uh, when we see this uh, ourselves or our mind becoming so dispassionate about the worldly things, that's not a bad sign. That's not. There's nothing wrong with that part of the freedom. Yeah, I, mean, I guess you could say you won't become more passionate as you practice mindfulness. This won't happen because really the answer to the question is that yes, passion is maybe bad. I mean, it is bad. You could say that, but it might be more easy to understand as just excessive. It's fruitless. It gets you caught up in lots of problems. It's it's about getting caught up caught up in problems. That's what it, that's what passion is. It's a type of getting caught up in things. That doesn't have any any resolution. It's it's it's, it's uh, unending, without end, perpetual, self perpetuating. It's just not really sustainable. Passion for mindfulness is just going to fizzle out and then. You'll be asking yourself, how do I get that passion back? And when you don't have the passion, you you don't practice. You can't use that as a support to practice. You have to practice out of wisdom and the knowledge of the benefit of the practice. And out of mindfulness in general, being mindful in daily life makes you more inclined to practice. Because you can't be passionate about mindfulness. You can just have passion of the idea of it. And it has to be related to things that are are illusory. Like you can be passionate about be- being a meditator. You can be passionate about the results that you conceive of in your mind that you want to gain, who you want to be, what you want to be free from. These are all just conceptual. And you can't actually be passionate about mindfulness. You can be passionate about... Pleasant states, calm states, peaceful states. Oh, that is acceptable. The present state. No, I'm no. It's not really acceptable. I mean, it's not. It's just not going to sustain you, because those states are impermanent, suffering, and non-self. They're they're not anything you can rely on. I mean, to some extent, yeah. If we talk, start getting into this kind of language, then there is a a zest for it. A piti, we call which is a kind of uh, um, interest, in a way, or chanda, as you say. Well, there are the idipadas, right, Bhante? Chanda, jitta, virya, vimatsa. Yeah. So to some, the... it's, not, it's not, passion isn't the right word in that case. But we might, we might use that kind of language in, mod- in ordinary speech, like someone who is passionate about mindfulness. It just doesn't quite fit. I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend looking at as it as, as being passionate. I think you should note the passion, even for mindfulness. If you like your practice, you should note that as well, because it's just going to disappoint you when you don't like it. You can only grow mindfulness, wisdom, clarity, contentment. These are all better words. You wanted to say like love for the practice, that would be still probably okay to say. 
The Buddha said, Dhamma kamo bhavang hoti, one who loves the Dhamma. And it's a, it's a strong strong language. Kama, kama is a word, you know, the Kama Sutra. Like kama is a word that has some undertones. Kama means love, or in some cases it means lust. It means uh, sensual desire. It means desire, basically. But the word itself is kind of, yeah, it's a simple word. It just means desire or love. That's okay. Passion is not a good one to use. Just implies things that are unwholesome. Love doesn't necessarily do that. Uh, is is there a difference between kama raga and kama chanda? I don't think so. No, not technically. Right. So kama also means just sensual, sensual, the sensual realm. Like having nothing to do with love or desire. It's just referring yes. to the senses. Depends how you use the word. Kama chanda refers to uh, when as when you have a sensual uh, desire, the chanda uh, in that moment uh, can, you can call kama chanda and the greed chetasika you can call kama raga. So both are in the same mind state. Kama raga, kama chanda. Yeah, is that is that is that based on something? I'm. I, I would say it's more that both it's, of them are just uh, loba chetasika. Loba, yes, yeah, it's loba. loba. But, but in that yeah. mindset, there's also uh, chanda chetasika as well. So both yeah, are chanda so associating with loba. Loba, yeah. But okay. that's why I ask. Like raga is the same thing. It's loba, right? Yeah, there, I mean, this is you're you're mixing you're mixing realms. The word raga would be used in a specific sense to talk about a specific type of of mind. Kama chanda probably as well. They're they're not used in abhidhamma sense. Yeah, so I'm I'm curious about the kama raga then that uh, is is like more passionate about. Uh, or burning, I I heard the word burning about uh, raga, right? Raga. Yeah. I'm not I'm not sure that it has to be burning. I'm, I think it actually comes from from raj in regards to. Hmm, I'm not sure actually where it comes from. Raj is in there's a dye there's a root that that relates to dyeing like dyeing color. Coloring something that's probably not quite related, but kama raga doesn't have to be that. I mean, in, in the fetters, right? Kama raga patika. So it's it's talking about something very simple. It's not talking about something extreme. It's just the opposite of patika. But the the kama part means that it's only for sensuality because there's still. Bawa Raga. Bawa Raga. It's also referred to as Bawa Tana. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was I was under the impression that Chanda is like a milder thing and uh, I mean Kama Chanda would be like milder than than Raga. Like I thought Raga is like the next level or even high level of um, wanting and uh, yeah, and I don't think lusting. So. I mean, lusting it, it, it might be word. used. It might be used in a more sort of charged sense. Sometimes I'm not even sure that that's the case. Like if you look, virago, we muchati. Right before you become free, you become viraga. You become you know, the raga disappears. Mm -hmm. So the so the Mara Mara has three daughters Tanha Rati Raga. So the Tanha mm -hmm. is more like greed. Rati is I think uh, hate. Raga is uh, lust. Yeah, lust. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is used in that way in some places, but not but not always. It's just used interchangeably. I mean, they obviously are all referring to the same thing. 
I have a language, another language question, Bhante. Like uh, when we say Niramisa Sukha, does it always mean the the happiness comes in Vipassana, or can we also take Jhana happiness as well? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's usually referring to Jhana happiness. I thought it is referring to the happiness comes in uh, the Vipassana and Jhana in Udayavyayana. No. I think it's usually, you'll have to look it up. You could probably find it in the digital poly reader if you did a commentary search. But just off the top of my head, I think it's referring to usually the jhanas. The idea is that it's not uh, physical. It's not like a physical pleasure, like a sexual yeah. pleasure, or that sort of thing, or a pleasure from coming from eating. Those are pleasurable, physical uh, or a sound that you hear, you hear a pleasant sound. It's uh, something that is unrelated to, which is why he says unworldly. But amisa, mm -hmm. I think, means object, literally. Amisa, or means meat, maybe, or something like a, a corporeal, a physical. It's just non physical, because when you're practicing jhana, well, the, the happiness doesn't come from some physical experience. I wanted to ask a question relating to mantra again. Um, and then um, going back to Om Mani Padme Hum, because I understand how we are using now mantra in the meditation, but isn't that the other kind of mantra with Om Mani Padme Hum more related with traditions and ceremony? The other word. Um, I mean, is a practice when you, I mean, I, I used to uh, chant Om Mani Padme Hum, is that for, but I didn't felt like it was a, a meditation-like practice. I think it can be, and it probably is in, by certain people, but it's like Namo Amitafa. If you've ever heard this, there's a huge group of Buddhists in East Asia, or not really Buddhists in my opinion, but well, they call themselves Buddhists, but um, they just repeat that day in and day out. And they even have little um, contraptions that will say it for you, so you don't have to say it. You just hear it all day because it's Namo Amitabha, and all day it's doing this. It just plays this noise in your house, a little box. So it's just, this is how normal people will use it. But there are people who really do get into it. And they, Namo Amitafam is Namo, like homage to uh, Avalokiteshvara. And they just say that again and again and again. And they're trying to gain, some people will do it intensively. So they are actually trying to gain states of purity of mind. Okay, I understand, because it does have the effect of calming, and yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, I understand. Because I have never practiced Samatha, so I don't have a comparison, but okay. So it's not related with tradition or ceremony, or it's, it can be seen as a practice, meditation-like practice. So, I mean, if you want to relate it to actual meditation, when you think of, let's go to something a little more orthodox, when you say Buddha or mindfulness of the Buddha, the thoughts about the Buddha are so much connected with wholesomeness. And the, the thoughts that it evokes are thoughts of wisdom and purity and related to compassion. And so your, your, mind, your mind is more often in a wholesome state because you are appreciating good things. I mean, as opposed to if you were to start fantasizing about something uh, or fantasizing about food or writing stories in your mind or that sort of thing or remembering traumatic experiences, when you think of those things, a lot of unwholesomeness arises and is cultivated. So when you're instead focused on the Buddha or Avalokiteshvara, there are specific states of mind. There's also issues uh, surrounding, say, Namo Amitafo or uh, Nam Nam Yoho Ringikyo or 
What's the Om Mani Padme Hum? Because they are doctrinal, there's 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 uh, baggage associated with them that we would find problematic. Like Namo Amitabha, the idea is to be born in the Avalokiteshvara pure realm, which is problematic. The idea that there's this Buddha there who will enlighten you, and all you have to do is just say this, and you'll go there. So the reasons for practicing, as we see in this sutta, the Anapanasati sutta, the whole, what is your purpose? Why are you watching the stomach, for example? Or why are you watching the breath, sorry? And that's going to have some effect on the results, the baggage that's associated with it. That's why we do determinations. People will, will have people say something like, within this hour, may this happen, or that sort of thing. It's an exercise that we give to intensive meditators. Yeah, if, you, if you are specifically looking for calmness and developing jhanas, it's best to keep to Buddhist techniques. For example, the kasinas are really good in uh, cultivating calmness of the jhanas. You see the, yeah, if you look at the difference, the objects are so simple and that's very purposeful. When you see other traditions, uh, Tibetan traditions can get really complicated and that would be considered problematic. There's too much baggage. Just going to create strangeness. It's like in, we've talked about this before, in some Thai groups where they will watch the breath, but say, Buddho, Buddho. It's very common in Thailand. I don't know if it's still, I'm assuming it's still just as common, but it was such a big thing for such a long time. For people to say buddho when they're focusing on the breath and it sounds ridiculous um i mean sorry to someone who's not familiar with buddhism or buddhist theory it doesn't sound wrong it sounds so like an interesting neat idea which is why a lot of people pick it up but for anyone who's familiar with the text it sounds ridiculous at face because well the stomach or the, the sorry the breath going in isn't buddha and the breath going out isn't do there's no relationship with the buddha but it is practically problematic, not just theoretically, it doesn't make sense. Practically, the results you often see are this confusion, where people will confuse and will believe that there is some Buddha, not the Buddha, the historic Buddha, but some enlightened experience. Because Buddha is one who is awake or aware or I mean, they actually describe it as the one who knows, which is technic which is literally what Buddha means, one. No, not exactly, but that's how they translate it in Thai Puru. And you'll read these books by people who practice Buddha, Buddha, watching the breath, is that they start to see the experience of watching the breath as Buddha, as one who knows. And so they'll talk about this mind that knows, and it, it leads to what I've read from people who are very well, monks who are very well esteemed, saying things like, uh, this is the mind that doesn't die or something like that. So they get quite lost because of the confusion. That's the kind of thing that you'll get from, worse, from things like Om Mane Padme Hom, Namo Amitafa, Nam Yoho Renge Kyo. Nam Yoho Renge Kyo is this uh, Japanese cult that... Um, teaches people to manifest things. So if you say this, nam myoho renge kyo, uh, often enough, you'll get rich and wealthy and anything you want will come to you. Banta, when you said about uh, uh, the practice of breathing and saying Buddha, in the text we read today, it says, I shall breathe in contemplating cessation, for instance. Isn't a similarity between that practice and what the, the, this text says? I shall breathe in contemplating and I shall breathe out contemplating. No, because you're contemplating something related to the breath. Buddha is not related to the breath. Okay, I see. And, and that it becomes problematic when they try to explain how it's related, where they say there's a, the one who knows, and it, it allows the art seems to incline them towards believing there's a being, a self. A self is the point. Yeah, I understand. Okay, thank you. What does he use the word, what does he say in the, in the, uh, 
Where does it use the word contemplated? Contemplates? For instance, in paragraph 27. Mm -hmm. well, can you read it to me? I'm reading the Pali. Um, I shall breathe in, so f from the beginning of the paragraph, because on mm -hmm. whatever occasion a bhikkhu trains does, I shall breathe in contemplating impermanence. Okay, stop you there. So let's clear this up because it's important. And we've had this problem before. It's I, I don't get it why he would use contemplated there. It's the, I think he uses the same thing in this Satipatthana Sutta. Do you know what the word is? Do you remember what the word should be? Uh, no. Seize. It's a very simple word. I shall breathe in seeing impermanence. Contemplates, oh, creates, creates unnecessary confusion. I mean, unnecessary complexity. I mean, it's not, it doesn't really make your problem, make the question you asked any, uh, any, any easier to understand, but a little bit. I mean, sees impermanence. I shall breathe in seeing impermanence. So you're not contemplating something. Yeah. There's nothing in there about contemplating. It's quite a simple word. It's 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 much less likely to trip someone up and say, why is the Buddha saying this? It's just saying something very simple. Seeing, I shall breathe in seeing impermanent. It, it, I don't it's, know why he doesn't use seeing. Seeing like observing. Observing. Yeah, like observing. But basically the point is that that's indic an indication of what you're going to see. And what you're going to notice. What's it's going like to become apparent to you? You're going to send your mind to. Kind of. No, not really. More like what's going to be. It's like uh, I shall. It's like noticing. I shall look at a tiger noticing its stripes. In the Singhali Sotion, it's very clear. Pante it says directly seeing. So, it's not terrible. It's this is a great. We have a great service here. Someone, nobody else went ahead and did this. So, I'm personally very thankful for having this translation. But good enough. It's always good, no matter what translation you use, to have the poly in front of you, so you don't make these mistakes. So you don't uh, miss things relying on the English. But even the digital Pali reader uh, translates anupasi like observer, one who contemplates. Doesn't it? It's not the digital Pali reader. It's the dictionaries that were uh, consumed and and, and uh, imported into the digital Pali reader. But they're all they all have sources. It's just those are the tr the dictionaries that we have. I think there's a, a better tool. This digital poly, what's it called? The digital poly dictionary. That probably, I assume it has better resources than the digital poly reader. So you can ask Delauer about it. He knows all about this digital poly dictionary. He says it's really good. Much better, apparently, at breaking words apart as well. The digital poly reader is old and very poorly made. I can say that because I made it. I wonder who made it. <laughs> I I know more than anyone how awful it is. But it works, right? I don't think it's awful at all. The yeah. party is there. Well, and simple. That's, be that's because you don't know how it works under the hood. It's pretty awful. Anyone who knows how to program would probably shudder to, to have to read the code. That's why they haven't fixed it, because they just can't. It's a mess. But it works. I mean, it does the job. Yeah. Kind of by brute force. It, 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 yeah. It doesn't work as well as the, the digital poly dictionary works a lot better because it was made by someone who knew what they were doing. More. But they, apparently. I mean, I would recommend checking it out. It's a newer and I think it's a better resource. He's put a lot of work into making sure it has... He quotes these high percentages 
uh, the author quotes these high percentages of, of accuracy, even with compounds, like it's able to pick apart compounds really well. But, you know, these people have such Bhikkhu Bodhi, Tanisaro, uh, Sujata is another one apparently who's done a bunch. Mm -hmm. They have such an intimate knowledge of the Pali that you do have to respect all of their work. But if, how, how does one find their teacher in this case if there are so many different schools and different ways to meditate? Uh, well, I want to read the Kalama Sutta. Look at the greed, anger, and delusion. That should always be your guide. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong about this, but um, monks recite the Patimokha every Oposita, right? One monk will. Everyone else listens. And it only is done when there's at least four monks staying together. In many cases, there's not four monks staying together, so they won't. They'll do something different something much more simple. But I guess there's a lot of monks who don't exactly follow the Patimokha. Like, I've heard there are monks, like a lot of groups of monks that will touch money. But I guess yep. they do this even while hearing recitations of the Patimokha regularly. Well, I probably shouldn't say this. Right, if I shouldn't I say don't want this, to say that. monks. Yeah, but it's okay if we're just talking generally, but it, I don't know if it's useful to say. Well, let's let's put it in context. So I'll first say that it's quite common for a monk who is doing the Patimokha to receive money for reciting the Patimokha, which probably shocks a lot of people to hear. But um, there is a difference of opinion about that rule. I mean, there's at least a vagueness to it where they will say money is not like money in the time of the Buddha. It wasn't so, I mean, it was gold. It was, and they're not correct when they say this, so this isn't really correct, but there is some vagueness. And the biggest argument, I think, which isn't, I don't, uh, yeah, well, it's not a great one, but let's put it two ways. So first is that the Sangha has agreed to use money, generally speaking. Monks who complete poly exams or um, who complete Dhamma exams are given money from the top monks of the district. This is in Thailand. Uh, but the other thing you can say is given that it's such a accepted and, and not just accepted, but it's uh, institutionally kind of agreed upon as being okay, that in some sense, it's the right thing to do to do what everyone else does. I was ostracized when I stopped using money. I was, there, was, there was hatred directed towards me. It was not something that anyone thought, oh, okay, that's cool what he's doing. That's, we respect that. The only one who really expect, respected it was Ajahn Tong, and he even at first wasn't really, didn't really believe in it. He said, you're going to have trouble, and he was right. But um, I think one thing he may not have seen, and I think it's more just because he wasn't really paying attention, because everyone using money, the idea of not using it just didn't, wasn't a part of his universe. But what I started to see is how great it was outside of the sphere of monks using money. When I was alone, and ever since I've been alone, it's just been great. People appreciate it, they respect it. It helps people understand the monastic life. And um, people have been like, when I was in Los Angeles, I got so much support that I would have never had if I was using money because people were, you know, trying to support me. They were saying, oh, he has no money. So people would drive me places. And no, I mean, I guess it had much more to do with being a teacher as well. But not using money is uh, a great thing. But why monks don't keep some of the rules is mostly because it's just following what everyone else does. And you may not think that's a very good excuse, and that's why a lot of us rebel. But you don't have a very good time of it if you rebel. I was kind of lucky that I could because I'm not Thai. They even had, uh, as far as I know, it was 
for my benefit in front of all the Sangha right before the Patimoka, just explaining why we should all keep the rules exactly the same. Uh, sila Samanyata, that you'll never get along unless all the monks are keeping the rules the same. And talking about the Buddha's last words, where he said, or the Buddha's dying words, where he said the monks could give up some of the rules if they wanted to. That is a really big one that, that you'll often hear used, that the Buddha said we can, that the rules aren't most important. And the other thing, of course, is the Buddha himself did say that the rules aren't important. And if someone is practicing adisila, then they really don't have to worry about breaking minor rules. Adisila means the five precepts? Adisila means higher sila. So I would think it refers to like uh, Indriya Samwara Sila, guarding the senses. It's basically meditation as far as I can see. Yeah, but then they have a problem there because if they um, don't practice meditation. Right. Well, that's the thing. But no, the point was, suppose you have a meditating monk who receives money the money isn't necessarily a hindrance to him. You spoke about that, that when the life becomes simpler, everything amplifies, like you get a bit more attached about the few possessions you have and the food and those things. Yeah, I don't see that as a real problem. <laughs> that would, if, you, if that were a problem, then get, making life simpler would be a bad thing, right? So no, that's not that's an issue that you deal with as a meditator. But that's honestly a good thing. I mean, if if all you have to worry about are simple things, then well, you're getting you're making progress. That's a good sign. So yeah, I mean, honestly, that's actually a good point. That some of the issues that monastic systems have are not as big as we might think they are, and you kind of have to be patient with them. Something you learn when you live in a monastery is that people are not perfect and expecting your fellow monastics to be perfect, unreasonable. You should be, um, you should be understanding for people's weaknesses and try and work together to overcome them over time. I mean, the expectation that monks should be perfect and never break the rules is, is unfair. It's not just unreasonable, it's also unfair. And that's why the rules are set up the way they are, not kicking people out because they break most of the rules. Most of the rules, you don't kick someone out. You just say, okay, well, good that you see it, and try again. The worst thing would be to, where they do, just decide to agree not to keep the rules. I don't think that's a very good idea. But Panta, about romanticizing, we usually romanticize about things that we don't know much about. Like, for instance, if you think, usually people romanticize about an actor or a pub public persons because we see only only the good part or we imagine only right. the good part. And I think that's why it's really useful for us to have a a view that, okay, the monastic life might not be perfect or as we imagine mm -hmm. it to be. Yeah, and again, as I said, it, well, you have to see that two sides. One, yes, it, it can have, becoming a monastic could in some ways harm your practice, but on the other side, you have to remember that just because the monastic life is not perfect doesn't make it valuable. So it could still be valuable. Just, yeah, romanticizing it can be dangerous because when you find out the truth, you can react. And from that perspective, is it a good practice like some people used to do, like become monks only for a limited uh, time period? Well... I mean, I would say it's probably a good practice to not put a deadline on it. You don't have to ordain for life. 
one issue with that is you really should give up all your possessions. So you have to be clear that if you do give it up, I mean, in the best case, you really shouldn't keep a a, a, a fallback support. You really should enter into it wholeheartedly, giving up everything. You don't have to. Uh, some people, I think, probably, well, many people ordain for a short time and keep all their wealth and monk, men who in Thailand who become monks and still have wives and children that they go back to when they disrobe. That's probably less valuable. Well, that is less valuable, certainly. But uh, if you keep it open-ended and you're open to the idea of it not working out, then, well, you just go back and do what you can as a layperson. Um, Bantaji, do you think since uh, you are um, you started out being a monk, uh, I think more than 20 years ago, right? Did the monastic uh, order uh, deteriorate since then, or so can you see? Can you observe a deterioration in there? Not really. No, I assume. I, I think twenty years isn't isn't really a long span. I don't think you're going to see a linear deterioration like that. How about 100 years? Yeah, maybe. Probably. I mean, I'd say it gets better and worse. It's not linear. I'd say it mm -hmm. got quite a bit better in the past 100 years. I'd say from the sounds of it, it's gotten a lot better. Well, it has to end after 5,000 years, so it will somehow get worse. Yeah, technology has probably um, introduced quite a few problems itself. Probably not been a great, a great uh, support for monasticism. On the other hand, it's done good things, as you can see. If you look on at monastics on the internet, there's some good things. Yeah. Well, my my attitude is as long as uh, uh, a monk hasn't broken parajika. And he's keeping to more precepts than me, so might as well respect him. You should respect everyone. We should. One really profound thing about Buddhism is even the worst, evilest people who you despise and who you just, you know, can't let go of the hate for, even though you're a Buddhist. Even them. They have uh, the likely the, the likelihood is, and probably inevitability is that they will become really good people at some point, even though they may never become enlightened. Mogalana killed his parents in a past life. I know that Mogalana was such a pure and wonderful person. He was an awful person. You should respect everyone, and uh, you know, read what the Buddha said. If if in the last ditch, the last case where you can't find anything good about them, that's when you would, the, your last ditch effort is to just have equanimity towards them. That's the, the, at worst, at worst, you're only equanimous towards them. Anytime you are upset about someone's activities, that's on you. I was just mentioning that even the evil, when you say evil person or evil something, I mean, that's also just evil, it's just momentary, right? The other moments could be that's very true. awesome. There's no such thing as an evil person. Because there's no such thing as a person. But I, I was just very deeply agreeing with you, Bante, with uh, like, if you don't like how someone behaves or something, it's, uh, I always think like that's my problem and that's me actually acting out and it's not them. Yeah. And uh, it's, that's so important because it's also the solution when you, when you think like that. Yeah, it, it works if you let people flare up and you just don't respond. You let people 
I mean, it's not let so much. I mean, there is, of course, room and necessity to reprimand people, even to say things. But the whole, the the only, the only crucial consideration is to not get upset. Yeah. Because if I'm annoyed by someone, that's on me. It's not the other person. Yeah, one one concern I had, and I think it's still valid, and it's not. I'm not the only one who had it. It's a common concern, is that there there is not a concerted effort to um, to follow the the guidelines, not just the rules, but to, for example, uh, acknowledge that a monk is behaving really badly and to do something about it like there is somewhat a lack of of organization something to keep in mind i think for any buddhist organization to have clear guidelines and to stick to them because it can devolve into chaos like say on our discord server we just let anyone post anything and just try to be mindful of it it would it would make the discord server useless it could make the discord server useless not able to fulfill its function. We had someone join our our Pali study group of all things when we were studying Pali on this server, and they just started saying the most awful things. So we kicked them off. Uh, when was this? Uh, last time we did Pali study. Uh-huh. It was really weird. They just showed up and they sounded at first like they were interested, but making sexual, I think it was something sexual. Yes. I think what Bante is saying is just setting up boundaries, right? Like what we tolerate and there's, there is a limit. Yeah. Being careful not to set too strict boundaries. But not being afraid to enforce the boundaries. Hey, which verse of the Dhammapada talks about um, an evil person being dragged down by the monastic life? Or is that part of the Dhammapada? Am I misremembering? Dragged down by the monastic life. I think that's not probably what it says. Okay. I mean, uh, um, right, There's there is some talk of how uh, a monastic who is corrupted and then uses the requisites is uh, there there's an evil to that i see i thought i was remembering the verse which talked about somebody going into the going forth into the homeless life and having that be a hindrance for them because of their evil qualities i guess i was misremembering no, that sounds very much not the Buddhist teaching. Maybe you're confusing that Dukkha Patipada, Sukha Patipada. I think there was a sutta like that, like uh, the way you practice. Yeah, that doesn't have anything to do with the monastic life, does it? No, the monastic life is generally portrayed as something that is... Uh, like completely useful like there is never any qualifier given to say that the monastic life is going to cause any problems I don't think that's fair to say at all it's portrayed and we see it as something completely good in all ways so the only qualifier is that you might fall into a community of people who are not following the monastic life. That's where. The, so, if that wasn't clear, that's what I was thinking when I was saying it could actually be a, be worse. It's not because of the monastic life. A, a bigger, a much bigger, and much well, a, a very a common problem that's unrelated to that is not the actual organization, but one's perception of it. It's very common for, especially foreigners to be very upset by the way things are done and unable to conform to ordinary things 
things that are not against the monastic life. I mean, I'm guilty of that. I have a hard time with some of this ritualistic stuff, and that's not true. I mean, I did. I bared with it and lived with it, but some people get very upset about it and uh, vocal and critical. And uh, But it's quite common for you to be unable to live in the monastic life. The robes get hot, I think is what they say. The robes start to get hot. And you're just unable to stay as a monk. And you often will blame your environment, not realizing that it's just your own defilements. Okay, have a good week, everyone. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you.